We trust the lamb, not the donkey or the elephant. Okay, so um, this is where we kind of start getting into people who were significant in this movement. And one of the people that I want to talk about throughout our conversation is a guy named Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, he was mm-hmm. instrumental, used by God uh, in this movement. And he becomes a Christian in a kind of a unique way and as part of the Hate Ashbury community. So can you tell us a little bit mm-hmm. about Lonnie Frisbee, how he started in the faith and the people he connected with there? Well, Lonnie Frisbee um, was a teenager in Southern California, and uh, he had begun experimenting with drugs and LSD. And uh, during one of his, uh, you know, pilgrimages out into the to the desert and, and uh, on an LSD trip, he had an experience, uh, what he described as a revelation, where God showed him a vision and uh, explained to him, you know, the truths about salvation and uh, also that uh, he would play a role therein. Now... All of that didn't click necessarily right away. Uh, He ended up in San Francisco, went up north, and began hanging out in Haight-Ashbury, and he was just part of that scene there. But he was, uh, while still ingesting drugs, and uh, um, he was talking about Jesus to people. And there he met a group of older uh, I guess you would call them proto hippie uh, Christians who were really were uh, had their roots back towards the beatnik days, but they had been converted um, through the auspices of a, uh, a Baptist church over in Marin County on the other side of the Bay Bridge, and uh, they ran into Frisbee and said, well, this guy is, you know, talking some crazy stuff and is talking about Jesus and the Christ consciousness and flying saucers. <laughs> and, it, and they said, uh, let's see if we can straighten him out. So they sort of took him under their wing, sobered him up, and, uh, you know, began to uh, try to just teach some biblical basics to him and brought him into their group. Now, their group uh, was a group uh, centered around um, a mini commune and a uh, for lack of a better word a drop-in center in haight ashbury called the living room and uh, uh, some folks there particularly a guy named ted wise and uh, some other folks and their wives um, were kind of the center of this whole thing and uh, they brought lonnie frisbee into that and began to sort of uh, you know just try to straighten up his theology a little bit and uh, get him involved. And from the very beginning, it sounds like there was this emphasis on communal living. Uh, right. And I guess that's just because, um, well, let, let me ask, what, wh- why is that? I mean, it seems weird to us to think that you're all going to live like in some dormitory together or that kind of thing. Was that just the cultural norm there in Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco in the late sixties, or was this something unique to Christians? Well, a communal thing had, you know, had gained some currency amongst the hip population. And, you know, of course there's a lot of things feeding into that social views, views on, uh, you know, the economy and, uh, you know, what, and what community really meant. And, um, so it was sort of natural that, you know, young Christians moving into that ethos would begin to think that, well, okay, that this makes sense. But what really made it come alive to them was they read the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. And they read in uh, Acts chapter 2 the sections about where they lived together and had all things in common. So <laughs> they decided, well, aha! <laughs> um there was this mindset present amongst these folks. It was very open to what they read in the Bible, and they took it seriously. And so, you know, they thought it only natural. They looked around at the church folks that they knew and wondered, well, what's the story? You know, why aren't they doing this? Because it's, you know, we're supposed to be Christians and disciples, and uh, we have this example in the book of Acts. Why aren't we doing it? So they naturally took to it, and it became... Um, in a lot of ways, a kind of a practical strategy 
for looking after each other and discipling young converts because, you know, a lot of these folks were coming out of the drug culture, had been into all sorts of behaviors, which, uh, you know, most middle class, you know, conservative Christians didn't think were a, were a great idea. You know, the whole free love concept and you know, dropping LSD and that sort of thing that didn't play in most congregations. <laughs> so um, the communal living was both a nod to the counterculture and also kind of a practical survival strategy for these folks to be able to live, to feed people, to give them a place to live. Because as I mentioned, Haight-Ashbury was a place where thousands of people were sleeping on the streets at night during this summer of love and for a couple of years thereafter, you know, a, a youth homeless population. And uh, so this was a practical way to kind of get around that, where they could disciple people, teach them basic biblical knowledge, and, you know, try to evangelize other folks as well. So here we have this uh, summer of love in Haight-Ashbury, drugs, uh, people coming from all over the country, young people coming from all over the country, hanging out together, um, talking about big ideas. These movements come out of Haight-Ashbury. And here we have that God intervenes. I, You know, I... I I don't want to put too much of a Christian spin on it. I know there's probably a different way to tell this story, but from the best I can tell, God intervenes in this kid's life, high school kid, Lonnie Frisbee, who came from an abusive house. And we'll get into some of that a little bit later and uh, uh, intervenes in his life so that he comes to faith in Christ, but he's still doing drugs. He's still in the, mm-hmm. he's still talking about this Christ consciousness kind of weird stuff. He hooks up with these other Christians, and they're trying to straighten him out while they're also telling everybody in Haight Ashbury about Jesus. People are responding. Mm-hmm. They're they're kind of coming to faith, and I guess if you're going to lay out kind of how you would expect revival to go, this isn't it, right? This isn't the story that you or I would probably write. Um, in other words. Um, this isn't kind of the culmination of some strategic initiative by a church, right? It was very unexpected right. and maybe not something that a lot of people were comfortable with. Well, in some ways, I mean, there's a, kind of like a twin heroes of this whole uh, development. Um, I look at, um, you know, here at one hand, we've got Ted Wise in this living room group who meet Lonnie Frisbee and try to straighten him out. But you've also got a group of pastors who kind of take a flyer on this idea. There was one in particular fellow by the name of John McDonald, who was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Mill Valley, California. And he had been the one to first make contact with Ted Wise and some of these other people back in 1966. And um, you know, he realized that these people could connect with the hippies and all these runaways in a way that they never could. <laughs> um, the John McDonald in his book in 1970 called the house of acts um, talks about how he went to hate Ashbury with Ted lies and how just completely, you know, he felt like he was, you know, the man on the moon walking the streets with Ted wise amongst all this craziness, you know, and um, he, uh, realizes that, you know, if someone is going to be a missionary to this place, it's probably not going to be the straight Baptist pastor with the tie and the sport coat walking the streets. Yeah. And uh, it really did turn out to be the, the case. So he got together with some other Baptist past, mostly Baptist pastors, and they started a little uh, nonprofit organization aimed at attempting to reach the hippies. And of course, there were a lot of people who weren't very comfortable with that idea. <laughs> And um, nonetheless, they persisted. Hey, I'm Keith. Thanks for watching the video. If you're interested in ending tribalism like we are, we have a podcast and a book. Both are called Truth Over Tribe. You can listen to the podcast on Apple or Spotify, and you can get the book off Amazon. I hope you'll check them out.